the taping. The old man arrived. And he was wearing a red plaid shirt. And he was blind. And they turned on some lights. And he started to sing. But he just kept starting over and sweating. And soon it was obvious that he didn't know any of the words. He just kept starting over and rocking back and forth and sweating. And the only words he seemed to be really sure of were hey, ah, uh, hey, hey. to discover 
that the person I was talking to was actually a four-year-old kid. <laughs> that his interest in sand was going out into his backyard and playing in his sandbox. And it was great, you know, I never would have come up to this guy at a party and said, hey, let's talk music and sand. <laughs> On the other hand, maybe this wasn't a four-year-old kid at all. Could have been anyone. Could have been an 80-year-old woman just pretending to be a four-year-old kid. I wouldn't know. Copy, paste, return, file. about the future and there are all these computer people there and everyone's really excited about new media and there are these seminars on e-cash and websites and search engines and home shopping and of course lots of demos of cyber sex and in the demos a man and a woman sit at their computers wearing skin tights rubber suits and they're all wired up to sensors and they're punching in commands. They shoot little shocks to the sensors. And she says, Can you feel my heartbeat? Can you feel my heartbeat? Speaking of rides, who 
Who thought of this phrase, the data highway, anyway? I think it was Dick Cavett who said, Highway? That's something long and gray and boring that kills 40 to 50,000 people a year. <laughs> but to sum it up, I'm ready to join the Lead Pencil Club, which is a sort of loose organization I just found out about. And it's based on Long Island. And this club advocates abolishing all electronics and going back to lead pencils and magic markers. But the thing is, it's a little hard to get in touch with any of the club members, actually. So if you want to join, it's pretty difficult. Of course, the main thing about technology is that it's really big and really powerful. And not very many people really understand it. So what do you do with something really big and powerful that you don't understand? You worship it. <laughs> so there's a lot of voodoo and a lot of morality that gets attached to it. Like, the technology's really great and will make our lives so much better and easier. Or, on the other hand, the technology isolates people turns them into weird, anti-social loners, typing away alone in their rooms. As if reading a book isn't also a deeply anti-social thing to do. <laughs> but the thing that scares me most is that every day, technology is getting more and more global and corporate and monolithic and impossible to escape. Recently, Someone said the saddest thing about the fall of the Berlin Wall is that you can no longer defect. There's nowhere left to go. And now that technology is everywhere in the world, most artists, like everyone else, are having to figure it out. Now, one of the main things I learned from going to all these futuristic tech conferences is that there is no such thing as an artist anymore. We are now officially known as content providers. <laughs> now, why does this sound like something from the Chinese Cultural Revolution? <laughs> content providers will house them over there. At first, I thought this was one of the most chilling things I'd ever heard. And then I thought about it for a while, and I sort of got used to it. And after about a year of hearing, and I'm completely adjusted. No, I actually like it. It sounds kind of practical and positive and inevitable. But as I see it, part of being a good content provider is providing good information. Now, last year, I was on a tour for several months, and we had a website called The Green Room, which is an electronic information room, and we put a lot of technical stuff about the tour in the site and lots of related topics and one of the biggest topics in the green room was food maybe because getting food on tour becomes a kind of obsession and it started with a recipe i posted and the recipe was for something called hotel hot dogs and i invented this recipe when i was on a press tour in germany and usually the interviews went on all day and well into the night and by the time they were over all the restaurants in town would be closed. So here's how to cook a fairly good dinner right in your hotel room. Now the ingredients include uh, two bratwurst, or Oscar Myers will also do, and the utensils include one lamp, a pocket knife, and wire strippers. And here's how to make it. First unwrap the bratwurst and place it on the bedside table. Then unplug the floor lamp, then, using the pocket knife, cut the lamp cord approximately three feet from the plug. Then, with the wire strippers, peel the insulation from the cord, leaving about 10 inches of exposed wire. Then, thread the wire through the broadburst and tie off the wire at the end. Then, just plug it in. <laughs> until the broadburst is crispy on the outside, approximately two seconds. And make sure the cooking time doesn't exceed three seconds, since the meat will explode at very high temperatures. 
and just relax and enjoy. Now this dish is excellent, accompanied by a glass of cool hotel tap water. <laughs> now in the U.S. or other territories where 110 is used, add two additional seconds to the cooking time. <laughs> anyway, after I posted this recipe, a lot of people began to write in about other kinds of food. And there were several postings about the high-speed cookbook written by that cross-country race car team. And the team did a coast-to-coast -coast race. And they couldn't stop to eat during the race. But they got so tired of sandwiches that they adapted some recipes that could be done quickly during pit stops using combustible engines. Things like pork roast, which goes. Wrap your pork roast tightly in 30 gauge aluminum. Tie next to the engine and roast at 70 miles per hour for six hours. <laughs> and then there's the roadkill cookbook that comes from Vermont. And this one tells you how to prepare the dead deer and possum that you find lying on the highway and how to test the tar content of the tread marks on the animal skins. Things like that. Now the cooking section in the green room sort of got out of hand because after a while, people on the net started to send real food to us. Now in Montreal, we got a shipment of beaver tail from someone in Canada. Now these tails came in a big bloody plastic bag with color photographs explaining how Eskimos trap beaver. Now here's how to do it, in case you find yourself needing to trap some. First, it has to be winter. So if it is, find a frozen lake and sharpen the ends of two large twisty branches. Then cut two holes in the ice near the beaver dam and insert the two branches down through the ice and into the water. Next, cut a piece of poplar, this is the bait, and insert that between the two branches. Then, sit around and wait. Now the idea is that the beaver will swim up to the poplar bait, but get caught in the twisty branches and drown. And when you think this might have happened, cut a big hole in the ice around the branches and pull the chunk of ice up. And if it worked, there'll be a drowned beaver, frozen stiff on the bottom of the chunk of ice. Now, I don't know how useful this is to you, but it reminded me that there are plenty of things that you don't really need to know. <laughs> and that a lot of information isn't always better than no information at all. Food. I think it does have a lot to do with new technology. And a couple of months ago, I was at one of those tech conferences in Germany, and there are a lot of people there who specialize in predicting the future of information. And there was one very old professor there, and he had a lot of colorful charts about information on an overhead projector. And at the beginning of his talk, he announced that he was going to take the long historical view of the subject. And he had a big chart that outlined all of human history. And he began. Thousands and thousands of years ago, back when men were hunters and gatherers, and everybody's looking at their watches because the other titles on his charts were things like the discovery of coal, the invention of sheep herding, and so on. But after about an hour and a half, he did get around to his main point, which was that this time, we are again in a hunting and gathering stage, but this time hunting for information. And trying to grab whatever rushes by. And it's all really disorganized, and there are no restaurants, no recipes yet. We're just sort of foraging. But the food analogy explained a lot to me. Because the frantic part of the digital revolution seems like a kind of real hunger. People really seem hungry. They seem starving. 
for information. And even more so, they're starving for new equipment. <laughs> and as technologies escalate and things get faster, a lot of people get caught up in what amounts to a sort of personal arms race, building up arsenals of equipment. And for what? And so you have to keep getting more and more stuff endlessly. More bandwidth, more storage, more memory, more speed. And you will never, ever have enough. It's like you're in a race against speed itself. It was the night flight from Houston. Almost perfect visibility. You could see the lights from all the little Texas towns far below. And I was sitting next to a 52-year-old woman who'd never been on a plane before. And she said her son had sent her a ticket and said, Mom, you've raised 10 kids. It's time you got on a plane. <laughs> and she was sitting in the window seat, staring out. And she kept talking about the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and pointing. And suddenly I realized that she thought we were in outer space, <laughs> looking down at the stars. And I said, lights down there are the lights from little towns. You know, last summer, I got a call from a national media organization inviting me to come to a very secret event that was being planned by an aerospace company. And they said they were going to launch the first civilian flight to the moon. And they wanted me to come along as a kind of observer, a content provider, to write about the experience. And I couldn't believe it. It was like a dream. I kept saying, to the moon? To the moon? And they said they couldn't tell me exactly where or when it would be because security was very, very tight. And they said, we'll call you back, and we'd appreciate it if you don't mention this to anyone. And I said, of course, I understand. Absolutely, you can count on me. And I hung up the phone and waited for about five minutes. Then I called five friends. I said, you won't believe this. But I just got this call, and I have been invited to go to the moon. I told them about how the first civilian flights are going to be starting in four years and how they're going to orbit the moon in a reusable craft and that they have all these plans to build resorts and retirement colonies there for old people who are losing their mobility and how great it's going to be for handicapped people who can suddenly do somersaults and free fall and what the new zero-g sports are going to be like and the new zero-g dance companies and when I stopped talking I just heard this silence on the other end of the line. I don't think any of my friends believe in me at all. It's like, after the big Cold War race to the moon was over, everybody just sort of forgot the moon was even up there. Two weeks later, they called again and said, Lift off is in approximately one month. So we want you to just be more or less on the alert. Can not tell you anything more? And I thought, gee, shouldn't I be doing some sort of training for this? I mean, you just climb on board? And I started having nightmares that I was a lifeguard on the moon. And 
people and things kept getting yanked out into space in this lunar riptide, and I had to keep going out there and rescuing them. In another nightmare, I was on the moon, looking back down at the Earth, and thinking about how billions of years ago, the moon had been sheared away from the Earth, and how it left this big, gaping hole that fills with water and became the Pacific Ocean, and how the moon keeps pulling on the Earth, trying to get back. The next call was two days later, and they said the flight was proceeding on schedule and that it was going to be a very important simulation. And I said, what do you mean simulation? You mean we're not going up? And they said, actually, this was not going to be an active launch. And they hoped there hadn't been any misunderstanding there. But the deal was that we were just going to sit on the ground in a capsule, pretending we were going to the moon. But they emphasized that this was a really important scientific project because they wanted to know whether this flight could be considered a vacation. Would it be relaxing? Would people want to go more than once? And they kept repeating that I was the perfect person to try to analyze the situation. Now, I really don't know why they picked me for this. I mean, I myself don't have any vacation skills at all. And partly this is genetic. My Swedish ancestors are really a pretty gloomy bunch. They get fun completely backwards. So if they go to a funeral where they're supposed to be sad, they find this very easy. It comes pretty naturally. So this makes them very happy. But when they're invited to a party where they're supposed to have fun, they find this incredibly difficult, and so they get even more depressed and sad. Anyway, I finally arrived at the simulation, determined to have fun, or at least to analyze whether other people were having any. Now, the day of the blast off, they were playing the theme from 2001 on a ghetto blaster, and the eight people chosen for the flight lined up to enter the craft, which was made of sheet rock and plywood and blinking lights. And for four days, we monitored their every move with microphones and cameras. Now, every few minutes, Mission Control would give them bits of information about where they supposedly were in space. And the flight crew kept giving them little jobs to do that had to be prefaced with the exact military time. 400 hours, humidity nominal, pressure nominal, thrust 0.478. And they had to memorize all these paramilitary commands and moves and repeat specs on things like liquid nitrogen. And every two hours, they were given questionnaires, things like, do you feel this is a good vacation so far? Do you find this flight relaxing? How do you feel about your fellow passengers? Has your opinion of them changed since the last questionnaire? <laughs> and it was all so incredibly claustrophobic. Now, if you can imagine being trapped in a parked station wagon for four days <laughs> with your family, answering questions every two hours about how much you like them, <laughs> this would give you some idea of the excitement level inside the capsule. You know, 20 minutes would go by and someone would say, do you want another pop tart? <laughs> no thanks. And we wrote all of this down. And with every hour, the capsule looked more and more like the day room in a mental ward. And finally, after four days, the passengers came out of the capsule and they were playing the 2001 theme song again. And I thought they'd all be in a really bad mood after following all these rules for four straight days. But instead, they were all saying things like, you know, 
This experience in space has really changed my life. I just see things differently now. Just to be up there in the middle of all those stars. It was awesome. I felt so small. And I thought, this is amazing. I am seeing the incredible power of the human imagination. And this is why humans will survive. Will survive. Because we're basically completely insane. Rockefeller Center. 
And it was 1931, and the backers sent this guy to Europe to see some constructivist architecture for inspiration. But Roxy was just bored by all of this civilization. It just seemed so intellectual. And by the end of the trip, it was all a bit blur. And he hadn't got one single idea. So he's on his way back west. And he's on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic, thinking about all of this. And he's staring at the sunset. And suddenly, he has this vision. A sunset. The new theater of the new world should be shaped like a giant sunset. Place where the fun never sets. And so he built this colossal theatrical machine with animal elevators and a revolving stage and electric fly lines and a huge sound system and mics that retracted automatically into the proscenium. But the trouble with Radio City was that all the shows were floats. Vaudeville was all about facial expressions and slapstick timing and rapport with the audience, all of which was totally swallowed up in this enormous sunset. And what did work was the dance teams, known as the Roxyettes, later shortened to the Rockettes, and they worked perfectly. Radio City became a kind of theatrical spectacle that was about mechanization, precision, huge, synchronized machine made of women working in formation. A kind of big animated sex machine. A theater starring speed and technology. Now, 65 years later, techno theaters everywhere. Entertainment centers and colossal malls and interactive arcades and ride films and simulations and VR. Disneyfication of the world is in full swing. And in the last few months, it finally reached New York. Now, one of the reasons I moved to New York City in the first place was to escape malls. <laughs> I thought they would never get there. But Times Square has just been remodeled as a giant mall to make room for the six new Disney theaters featuring their version of all-American fun. Now, another part of the trend is theme parks. And for a few years now, I've been working on one with Peter Gabriel and Brian Eno called Real World. <laughs> and this project goes back to 1981. And it was Peter's dream to make a park that would give people a chance to experience three-dimensional sounds and images. And he picked a place near London, and he had it all planned. The park would be entirely underground. And you'd go into these cave-like spaces and put up what looked like giant hair dryers, the precursors of VR gear, and see holographic images and hear holophonic sound. And then over the next few years, he talked to hundreds of people about this idea, and it became an extremely ambitious project with lots of venues and cafes and large electronic theaters and lots and lots of rides. And one of the rides that Peter designed was called the River of Life. And this was a water ride that would take people around the seven stages of life in little boats. And we decided to ask several different artists to design each stage. So John Waters was going to design the adolescent stage. <laughs> and so the writers would move through all these pictures and smells, like being inside a John Waters movie. And you'd have the option of repeating stages or skipping them. Like it, you could relive your childhood endlessly. Or skip your midlife crisis completely. And at the end of the ride, you were dumped into a gene pool where you could decide whether to just dissolve or take on the karma generated by your actions during the ride and go again. <laughs> now, at one point, the park was going to be in Tokyo, and we also were thinking of putting it on top of a mesa in New Mexico. And then finally, there was an offer for the mayor of Barcelona to put the park in the middle of his city. 
Now Barcelona, with its spooky Gaudi architecture, seemed the perfect place, sort of haunted. But the proposed site was near the university, in a large so-called undeveloped area. And from here there was a view of Tibidabo, Barcelona's oldest theme park, which was perched on top of a high bluff. It was built back in the late 19th century, and it's still this kind of favorite, almost magical spot. Kind of park with the huge, rickety wooden roller coaster, and merry go rounds with crumbling one-eyed wooden horses, and carny barkers, and caravans. And by the way, Tibidabo got its name from the Latin, and this I give to you, or and all this will be yours. And these are the words the devil said to Jesus when he took him out to the 40 days in the wilderness to try to tempt him into the typical devil's deal. You do this for me, and I'll give all this to you. And he's pointing more or less right at our sight. Anyway, you enter a real world through a gate flanked by two 60-foot freestanding tornadoes. And there was going to be a big monorail and a TV station and a radio station and restaurants and a quiet club and a spherical dance club where dancers could control images with their feet. And we finally began to ask all of these designers and park experts to join us in our meetings to help us figure out how to realize these ideas. And these meetings were great, you know, say anything and say things like how about if a large black cloud hovers over the park and triggers a forest of talking trees and some of these guys would actually write down research a large black cloud for a talking tree forest <laughs> but the whole idea was to make a place designed by artists a place about invention rather than just another thrill space. I mean, it really seems like most theme parks are designed on the assumption that people are just so out of touch and totally anesthetized that they need to be spun around a few hundred times and dropped on their heads to feel anything at all. But the last time I visited the site in Barcelona, I went by myself to just sort of look around. And this land is covered with all this dense foliage. And from the outside, you can see the smoke from all these squatters' fires. And all the buildings are hidden under these very thick vines. And as I passed a thick bush, about 50 tiny hummingbirds fluttered out. And I thought to myself, great, we're gonna come in here and chop everything down and put in a theme park. Good thinking. So at the moment, I'm thinking that some things are really better as ideas than reality. And the real world may just be one of these things. Anyway, tech is everywhere now. And recently, as a content provider. I've been thinking that maybe artists are actually using the wrong tools. Now that almost everybody is happily painting away in Photoshop and making their millions of colors websites and creating perfectly scanned in photorealist interactive butterflies programmed to make ambient house music as they mate in various virtual environments, maybe it's a good time for artists to start thinking along some other lines. Now I have a friend who's planning to open a club in London, and it's going to be a big multimedia workshop where artists can use a lot of the cool new tools. Now the building used to be a mental hospital, and we were sitting around talking about how much mental hospitals are like art schools. <laughs> and, you know, just all of these people locked away in their rooms working on really specific, really kind of peculiar things with enormous concentration. And I was telling my friend my theory that artists weren't using the right tools. And 
I suggested doing some projects at the club, some therapies, in homage to its history as a mental institution. Therapies for people who had been using a little too much technology. And they would include things like scale therapy, which would be about how to change scale quickly and flexibly. Like how on the one hand we're all just meaningless specks of dust floating about in the cosmos. And on the other hand, we can suddenly fill up an entire room with one single idea. Another would be speed therapy, subtitled The Speed of Darkness. And speed therapy would touch on St. Thomas Aquinas, who describes the way time seems to stop between messages from angels. The angel delivers a message, and then a thousand years go by of absolutely nothing until there's another totally unrelated message. And time just seems to halt between these messages. There's no stream, no connections. So speed therapy would speculate about what happens in these digital pauses. And this is a fairly long-term therapy. Now another would be ego therapy, which would ask the question, is art about self-expression? And this might involve building some three-dimensional prototypes. And I'm thinking now of a of a room that I was planning to build on my loft at one point. And this was going to be an ego room, a very tall vertical room filled with posters from my own shows and flattering photographs of myself and awards and great reviews. And in the middle of this was going to be a trampoline, so I could just, you know, keep jumping up over and over. And then there's uh, identity therapy, which is based on the principle that if you don't really know who you are anyway, it frees you. Now, I got this idea from some friends who work in an office, and they said that they were getting really jagged from their coffee breaks, and every time they had coffee, they were just feeling more and more driven, you know, it wasn't relaxing at all. So they started having wig breaks instead, and around 11 every morning, they went into a small room, and they tried on wigs for 15 minutes, and after a while, they weren't really that certain about who they were anymore, and they found this pretty relaxing. So that's wig therapy, and then there's taboo therapy, which involves finding out what really grosses everyone out, starting with a recent controversy that came up in a so-called alternative New York art space. And it turns out that people on this scene, which has sponsored performances ranging from live scarification to bloody urine soakings, were offended by a recent very graphic performance featuring really old people having sex. So if you can find out what scares people, you might also find out what they like and value. And in music therapy, there's words that never appear in songs, which involves writing lists of these words, like vapor and lawyers and calcium and imprecation and so on. And then obviously writing songs using as many of them as possible. And last, there's sleep therapy, which means that you just lose consciousness in various ways for about a year. And when you come to, there'll be a lot of new things that are bothering you. And your old problems will seem really trivial.
when you hear someone screaming, just goes in one ear. music that came from their radios, that came from their hearts. They listened to the music, to the sweet swinging music that came from their radios, that came from their hearts.
something called interspecies communication. And you can find out all sorts of things there, like about how whales talk. And they talk to each other using acoustic holograms. And these are like giant thought balloons, which of course we have no idea how to translate. The biggest animals in the world, we have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And at this site, one of the researchers said, To give you some idea how hard it is to figure out what whales are saying, try to imagine translating a Beethoven symphony into words, all the notes into words, not to mention things like rhythm and harmony and harmonics. It's impossible. But out on the web, it's really easy to feel sort of isolated. And so a lot of the signs, sites seem to be designed like ads ads for yourself. So you come across all these personal websites and quick time movies of the family dog and personality sketches and diaries. And it's a way of making your own life into a series of icons and abstractions and sitcoms. And it uses some of the same techniques that pop culture uses to make its own icons, to turn otherwise kind of average people into superheroes. It reminds me of something that I saw last summer in Zurich. And I was passing the train station, and I heard what sounded like a riot. Now, I'm always ready for a riot. And I happened to have my Polaroid, so I rushed into the station. And in the middle of the station, there was this huge statue of Michael Jackson, made of fiberglass to look like granite. And this thing was about four stories high. And it looked like a combination of Stalin and some Nordic god. And he's wearing a bikini and Mexican-style Bundahiro bullet belt strapped across the chest. And shoes the size of cars. And he was standing, his legs far apart, on a huge pedestal inscribed Michael Jackson, his story. And there was a really big sound system, but they weren't playing this record. It was only sound effects of uneasy crowds about to riot. You know, blah, 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 blah. So it turned out to be a very good idea, since it's never actually good PR to unveil something of this size in total silence. And the only people there were about 200 members of the Brazilian soccer team stuck between trains in the station, sitting on their sports sacks, making ice cream cones, and me, and some early commuters on their way out to suburbia, and then all these rioting crowd sound effects echoing off the walls of the station. And there was a Swiss guy in gold lame pants standing on the pedestal between these gargantuan legs. And he had a microphone, and he was giving some kind of really enthusiastic political speech in the Swiss German dialect. And apparently, one of the sub themes of the record is that somehow Michael Jackson's music was instrumental in the freeing of Eastern Europe. And I just stood there laughing for about 10 minutes. I thought it was so great. No, actually, I've always thought of Michael Jackson as just another pop artist, although I really liked the production. But as I was looking at the statue, I was really changing my mind. I mean, my estimation of his art shot up by about a thousand percent. And I now think he may be one of the greatest artists of the century. I mean, conceiving yourself as a giant action doll from outer space and using Stalinist propaganda techniques, this is a certain kind of weird genius. And so what if he didn't actually think of it himself? You know, a lot of artists work in teams now. And then, of course, there's a the part about actually marrying and then divorcing the king's daughter, which adds a whole other dimension. I mean, this guy is fantastic. And one of the best websites to check in is Graceland. 
where you can find out things like that Elvis used to go riding around with the police. And he loved stopping people, pulling them over, but he didn't actually have the authority to write out tickets. So he would just, you know, give them an autograph instead. Now, last time I was at the Graceland site, I checked into an electronic seance in which they managed to contact the king in the afterworld. And the communication system was two knocks. Yes. And it was at a conference on, naturally, the future of communications and technology. And it was coming from Montreal, where there was a conference on theater and new music. And they had hookups uh, with the director Robert Lepage in Quebec City and a digital artist in Amsterdam and myself in Frankfurt. And this is the kind of system in which the audio was a continuous stream, but the picture only updated itself every few seconds as still images. So you'd be looking at a series of these sort of frozen <laughs> expressions, and it always looked like the person who was talking was sort of shocked and amazed by the words that had just come out of their <laughs> mouths. <laughs> But the conscience began with a lot of <coughs> generalizations about um, technology, you know, really stiff, you know, like, what will theater look like on the net, blah, 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 you know? And at one point, you know, we were having a lot of trouble with the audio in our studio, and um, so they kept saying, uh, Frankfurt, Frankfurt, could you please get off the line? Now, it, it's not that I personally mind being asked to leave, but since I was Frankfurt, I took it pretty personally. So finally we worked it out and, and continued, but the high point was definitely Pincus, who suddenly came online 
And his voice is like extra loud, like he was using one of the first phones ever invented and he's shouting, hey, Lori, uh, can you hear me? Is this thing working? Uh, it's nice to meet you. Say, uh, how much did you practice the violin today? And this really caught me off guard because this was an, an actual question, you know, something I had to answer and suddenly I had to respond and I, I don't know why I did this. Maybe I just panicked, you know, I just, I said, Eight hours. I practiced for eight hours. I have practiced for eight hours since I was about twelve. You know, but I, I don't know really why I said that. Maybe because his voice reminded me of my violin teacher, who I also lied to about the amount of time that I practiced. And anyway, uh, Pincus went on. So uh, he was he was like very enthusiastic about this new toy. You know, he was moving around and making these gestures, and I was watching his hands and thinking, what a great master class he could do this way. And then, and then I thought, you know, he could do so many things this way. You know, like Marty Scorsese could meet with young filmmakers and talk to them about their movies and you know, and all sorts of things. And anyway, Pinkus went on. Um, okay, so Lori, so you're in Frankfurt. Now just go over to the Alta Opera, and just to your right, look to your right, and you'll see this fantastic Italian restaurant, and it's best in Germany, and tell them Pinkus sent you. And that did it for me. I mean, it, that was really practical. And I <laughs> did go over to the restaurant. It was closed, by the way, but nothing was perfect. Anyway, back to control rooms. The main thing, at least in America, is that computers have a lot to do with work. And work is a sort of religion in America. I mean, we actually call it the word work ethic. I mean, you turn on the TV and there are all these shows about people working. Doctors, lawyers, and cops, spacemen, teams of people on the job. So you come home from work and you turn on the TV and you watch these other people work. And then after these shows, you know, there's this news, and the newscasters are sitting behind their desks, working. And after that, a sound of the talk show host, and he's still at work too, even though by now it's about midnight. And he's still sitting behind a desk, he's like this workaholic, you know, the last guy to leave the office kind of guy. And he's got a phone, and he always seems sort of pressed for time. I mean, we really like work a lot. Now, most of these TV work teams, whatever their jobs, have a boss. And he, she is fill in the blank precinct captain, top surgeon, anchorman, white haired head of the law firm. And this character is usually pretty empathetic. Someone who's got the big picture, calm, in control. And these are the characters that the plots usually hinge on. Now, I was thinking of these two well-known epic American stories that are about work and control. And they're both stories about teams of people working in ships. And the stories are Star Trek and Moby Dick, and their ships, the Enterprise and the Pequod. Now, these stories are separated by almost 150 years. And although they have a lot in common, very long voyage, powerful captain, dangerous encounters, and wild adventures. They couldn't be more different. Now in the Star Trek series, the ship is pretty high tech, and the immaculate burgers are endlessly typing commands into their computers and talking into their headsets, presumably affecting the course of the ship somehow. But the person who's really in charge is up on the bridge. And the plot of each episode is the same. Everyone was working away, and suddenly, the ship goes out of control for some reason or other, and the captain starts yelling from the bridge. I've lost control. I've lost control of the ship. Now, losing control is the worst thing that could happen. And the whole plot of the story is how the captain regains control of the ship. And it's no coincidence that the whole drama happens in the control room. Now in Moby Dick, the ship is also pretty high tech <coughs> by 19th century standards. A kind of a floating factory. And there's the hardworking crew and the captain. 
Except, in this ship, the captain is completely crazy. But what finally happens is Moby Dick is pretty horrendous. The captain goes more or less insane. The ship is snapped in half. The crew drowns. And the captain is dragged to the bottom of the ocean by the whale he's been fanatically hunting. The end. And there aren't even any little epigrams. Like in King Lear, when in the end, the king learns that he can love some people just a little bit. In Moby Dick, it all just ends. And it's such an incredibly dark story. I mean, you can't imagine telling a story like that now. For example, the Enterprise explodes in a huge accident, and all the debris from the wreck gets sucked into a black hole, and in the last shot, there's a single spaceman turning around, swinging around and around, along in space. started to drop straight down, flipping over and over. Then the other engine died, and we went completely out of control. New York City started to get taller and taller. A voice came over the intercom and said, Our pilot has informed us that we are about to attempt a crash landing. Please extinguish all cigarettes. Place your chain cables in their upright, locked position. Your captain says, please do not panic. Your captain says, place your head in your hands. Captain says, place your head in your knees. Captain says, put your hands on your head, put your hands on your knees. <laughs> <laughs> this is your captain. Have you lost? We are going down. We are all going down. Together. As it turned out, it was caught in a downdraft and rammed into a bank. It was, in short, a miracle. But afterwards, I was terrified of getting on the planes. The minute I started walking down that aisle, my eyes would clamp shut and I would fall into a deep, impenetrable sleep. You don't want to see this. You don't want to be here. Have you lost your dog? Finally, I was able to remain conscious, but I always had to go up to the forward cabin and ask the stewardesses if I could sit next to them. Uh, hi, uh, mind if I 
join you? And they were always rather irritated. Oh, all right, what a baby. And I watched their uniforms crack as we made nervous chit-chat. Uh, sometimes even this didn't work, and I'd have to find one of the other passengers to talk to. Now, you can spot these people immediately. There's one on every flight. Someone who's really on your wavelength. Now, I was on a flight from LA when I spotted one of them, sitting across the aisle. A girl, about 15, and she had this stuffed rabbit set up on her tray table, and she kept arranging and rearranging the rabbit and kind of waving to it. Hi. Hi there. And I decided, this is the one that I want to sit next to. So I sat down and we started to talk, and, and suddenly I realized she was speaking an entirely different language. Computerese, a kind of a high-tech lingo. Everything was circuitry, electronics, switching. If she didn't understand something, it just didn't scan. Now, we talked mostly about her boyfriend, and this guy was never in a bad mood. He was in a bad mood. Moody kind of a guy. And the romance was apparently kind of rocky, and she kept saying, Man, oh man, you know, like, oh man, it's so digital. And she just meant the relationship was on again, off again. Always two things, switching, current runs through bodies, and then it doesn't. It was a language of sounds, of noise, of switching, of signals. It was the language of the rabbit, the caribou, the penguin. The beaver, a language of the past. Current runs through bodies, and then it doesn't. On again, off again. Always two things switching. One thing instantly replaces another. It was the language of the future. Put your knees up to your chin. Have you lost your tongue? Put your hands over Jump out of the plane. There is no pilot. You are not alone. This is the language of the on again, off again future.
really hard to express everything in words. And it's for something called a pillow speaker, and that looks like this. And usually these speakers are uh, used so that you can record things and then play them back while you sleep. So you can do things like learn German in your own personal night school. Uh, this never worked for me. I, I just usually woke up feeling sort of paranoid. <laughs> I always wanted to sing like a violin, so that's what I've recorded here. But being a somewhat uh, oral person, I, I get a thrill out of putting electronics in my mouth, so 
Thank you.